Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I, as usual, am your host, Sarah, and as usual, I am very happy to be with you to bring you another author interview. This time I am speaking with author Mark Chestnut. Uh, We're speaking about a memoir. Before we do that, though, how was your weekend? Hope that you did something enjoyable. We are just running plowing something our way through 2023 already we are uh, quickly approaching february which is crazy um but good my aunt is coming to visit the end of february in just a little over a month she will be here so i'm excited about that as for the weekend we had such a lazy weekend it was so nice oh my goodness I we were we worked a lot of crazy hours last week and the lazy weekend after the crazy week was perfect. We watched TV, we snuggled with the dogs. Um I can't remember if I mentioned last week that we took had to take both dogs to the vet. And then actually yesterday I ended up taking our girl dog back to the vet because she has a cold now on top of the issues she was having last week, but they're both doing better. Um, and so really, just the, the the weekend was perfect, and I definitely needed the, the lazy time just hanging out with the hubby and the dogs and um, not really doing much. I still, you know, ran errands and did some productive things, but um, also got some downtime, so cannot complain about that. At any rate, as I mentioned, I'm speaking today with Mark Chestnut. We are talking about his memoir. It's called Prepare for Departure. Let me go ahead and give you the description of that book. At an early age, award-winning travel writer Mark Chestnut learned to dodge discomfort by jumping on the nearest plane, bus, or car. That tactic proved especially useful when his single mother made it clear that there was no room for discussion about his gay identity. Mark, Overwhelmed with wanderlust, shoplifts in airports, avoids Southern Baptist salvation, acts like Hillary Clinton in a nursing home, and dresses in drag with his grandfather. He even creates an imaginary airline and flies away. Now, as 89-year-old Eunice Chestnut moves to a New York City nursing home to be near her son, Mark's obsession with travel takes a back seat as he embarks on the most emotional journey of all. More than an end-of-life memoir, more than a collection of childhood memories and travel stories. Prepare for Departure showcases what happens when a permissive mother and a misfit son face death while revisiting life. Buckle your seatbelts for a witty, touching, and darkly humorous trip through time, loss, forgiveness, and acceptance. And again, that is uh, the description of Prepare for Departure, and I did not give you the subtitle. The subtitle is Notes on a Single Mother, a Misfit Son, Inevitable Mortality, and the Enduring Allure of Frequent Flyer Miles. <laughs> that is the, not maybe the most detailed title ever, but it is, you know me, I love, I love details. I, I love, this is like the subtitle version of my kind of epilogue, right? I love a good epilogue that tells me everything that happened to those characters down through the next three generations. <laughs> and I love how much this subtitle tells me, making me want to, if I hadn't already read the book for this interview, it, it would make me want to read this book just to find out more, to fill in the blanks where those commas are, right? Notes on a single mother, a misfit son, inevitable mortality, and the enduring allure of frequent flyer miles. That right there would suck me in. And this book also sucked me in because it is hilarious. It is poignant. It 
it, it, there's so many different layers, and Mark's going to talk about those in the interview, of different entry points that people who are reading the memoir can can jump into the book with, you know, whether you've experienced um, end-of-life issues with a parent um, or someone that you love, whether you felt like you were a misfit kid, whether you were raised by a single mother, whether you were... You had you had a coming out experience, or I mean, there's just so many different layers, like I said, to this book and different pl- points of entry. Uh, so, kind of whatever your experience is, there's probably going to be something in this that is going to resonate with you, and it certainly did with me. Um, Mark is a self-identified misfit. And he talks about growing up, and yeah, he was a bit of a misfit kid, but. That just made him so endearing to me uh, as a bit of a misfit myself. I just, I want to go back in time and and hug that little kid, which would be awkward for everyone. <laughs> um, all right, who is this random middle-aged woman who has appeared out of nowhere and is hugging me and then going back in her time machine? No, that's too awkward. But you know what? Time to turn to the interview because I have started to ramble about time travel. So... <laughs> Again, the book is called Prepare for Departure. The author is Mark Chestnut. Let, let's turn it to the interview. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm very happy to be speaking with you. I'm happy to have you here and excited to talk about your memoir, Prepare for Departure. But before we do that, um, if you can just share a little bit about yourself um, before we start talking about the book, that would be great. Sure. Well, um, I'm a full-time freelance travel writer, and I've been based in New York City for many years, but I'm originally from a small town in western New York State called Brockport, New York, and my family was originally from the state of Kentucky, so I spent a lot of time in that area, too, when I was growing up. Um, I've been addicted to travel since a very early age, and writing has been my primary outlet for expression for just as long, for more years than I can remember. So it's really been a, a dream come true to have this book come out and hear the people's responses to the book, which are sometimes surprising, but always really interesting to hear. Yeah, I bet. I, I just love, uh, after reading the memoir and some of your experiences at growing up, I love that you became a travel writer, and we'll talk more about why, <laughs> but uh, not everybody gets to kind of live out some of those childhood dreams. Yeah, that's true, and I'm, I'm very lucky. I mean, it's taken work, <laughs> like sure. any like any kind of career. It does, it does take work and some strategizing and planning, but also, it, like everything else, it, it takes some luck, too, so I feel very lucky and fortunate to be able to do something that I'm passionate about. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So give an overview of the memoir. Well, um, uh, the Prepare for Departure, I like to describe it as the, the story of, uh, of a mother and son who are facing the final months of the mother's life as they revisit their lives together. And it's really kind of a multifaceted story. So it's it's a, a coming of age story. It's a coming out story. It's an end of life story. Um, there are a lot of universal themes like that. But it also happens to be my, my story and my mother's story uh, because it is a memoir about our lives together and the evolution of our relationship. So, but it's also a story about kind of following your dreams, you know, feeling like a misfit, but but finding your path in life as well, and caring for aging parents. So it deals with a lot of issues that have been resonating with people in different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of different layers to the story. At the beginning, you when your your mother first moves closer to you to um, go into the nursing home, you talk about how you had this image in your head of this kind of buddy road trip movie where you and your mom would reminisce and have this great experience, and that didn't happen. But in some ways, the book became that. Is is that somewhat accurate? Yeah, I think that's a good way of uh, kind of describing it because. Um, you know, it may be cliche to say life is a journey, but it is. And so while I didn't get to do that final road trip with my mother uh, that I had kind of thought would be a wonderful mother-son experience to have, you know, the, our final months together were were a journey on their own, you know, in their own right. And so it was more, it was an emotional journey and it was, a, you know, a journey in different ways. But still, yeah, we did take a, a trip together, you know, in the book. Overall, it just wasn't a, it just wasn't a road trip, although there are road trips and air trips and all, all different kinds of travel that we did together that are in the book. 
Yes. And those are so fun to read about. Actually, your your mom, your mom by herself just sounds like a really fun person. And then your relationship together was fun to read about and and kind of experience along with you as you tell it from um, your perspective. So that for me, that was my what I enjoyed most about the book was just getting to know the both of you separately and together. Oh, good. Well, thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. And yeah, I think my mother was a, was a funny woman, and she was a smart woman. She, I think she was smarter than me, and she may have been funnier than me. So yeah, it, she was the kind of person that even if she hadn't been my mother, I think would have been fun to write a fun character to write. You know, because she did have a lot of personality, a lot of character, and a, and a sharp sense of humor. So that was one of my goals with the book is, is to portray a person um, like that you know, to show her various aspects, you know, the, her, her good sides or her more difficult sides and a sense of humor, which for me is always important too. Mm -hmm. And you had a, an interesting relationship because you're not an only child, but your sister is 13 years older. So you basically grew up as an only child. Your father died when you were very young. So it really was just you and your mom for a lot of your growing up. Can you talk a little bit about how that dynamic, um, comes into play in terms of the relationship that you had with your mom? Sure. And yeah, I like to, I like to say that um, I was raised as an only child, even though I'm not an only child. Um, and my sister, it's not like my sister was a stranger or anything. It's just that the day that I started kindergarten, she left for, and moved away to college. And so I know some people have vivid memories of their early, early childhood, but I don't, maybe I'm just not smart enough to, but um but yeah, so I don't remember ever living with her when I was growing up. So she was around, but she was off, you know, more in the distance. I didn't see her as much. So yeah, and between that and then my father dying that same year when I was four, um, almost all of my childhood memories and my growing up experiences were really just my mother and me. So it really was just a two person household. And I think, you know, there, I think there's like psychological studies about that. And, and, and the, the relationship is different between a parent and child. I think when it's just one parent and one child and nobody else around. And so it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I think there, and I explore this in the book, uh, how things can be different when you're an only kid with an old, with a single parent is that, you know, there's, for example, there's not as much of a, of a need for, for set, you know, set rules, for example, you know, if you have two kids or three kids, you know, you may have to say, okay, nobody goes into the living room after 5 p.m. or whatever kind of kind of rule. When it's just one kid, she didn't really have to make up these these set rules because it they just was everything was kind of amorphous, which maybe, you know, I think that informs like my personality now, where like I don't need a structure to setting because I didn't grow up with a structure to setting, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I pause that in an interesting place because I was about to say, yeah, it does. And, and you probably hear that in there. And so when we come back from the break, it's going to pick up with that. And <laughs> so put a pin in this conversation, but uh, that does tell you that we are taking the first break of this episode. And when we come back, this conversation will continue. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC book review podcast, and I'll be right back. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with Mark Chestnut. Just to remind you, before the break, he was talking about um, the structure with which he grew up and the relationship that he had with his mother. And I said, yes, I understood. And, <laughs> and so this question is going to pick up with an and, and I told you to put a pin in that conversation. And now 
get ready to take the pin out when, as we return to the interview. And I'm thinking of one scene in the book where you are about 12 or 13 and your friend says, hey, just, hey, have your mom drive us to the airport. And she does. And this is obviously pre 9-11 because you guys just wandered around the airport. But your mom was like, yeah, I'll just bring a book. I'll sit around while my kids, my kid's friend run around the airport. Don't be gone too long. Right. Yeah. And we have, when people hear about that, they're like, oh, my gosh, my mother never would have done that. So, yeah, I think yeah. one of the reasons why it was possible was because it was just it was just her and me. So it's not like if she did me a favor like that, she didn't have three other kids that she'd have to do strange favors for. It was just me. And she was just she was very permissive. And, and she she allowed me to indulge and explore my my passions and my interests, which have always been, you know, travel and creativity. And so. Yeah, I was really lucky about that. And a couple of people who've read the book have actually said that in some ways like that, my mother's uh, personality almost seemed grandmotherly. You know how you how people always say like their grandmothers and their grandparents really were the mm -hmm. ones who like, you know, kind of treated you specially or, you know, indulged you more. So in some ways, I, I think that is a valid point that in, in some ways my mother was almost grandmotherly in terms of she would do things that that a lot of parents might not be able to do for their kids or might not want to do. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So when you think about this story and um, not only the relationship with your mom, but your your experiences growing up and the, the path that you took that led you to where you are now, what was your impetus to write it as a memoir? Well, you know, I really didn't set out to write a book uh, when, in terms of this this particular story. I started writing the book what became the book for my own personal and psychological reasons, because in 2015, my mother was diagnosed with a brain tumor and she started to go downhill uh, fairly quickly over the course of, of a year or two. And so it was really difficult to deal with for her and for me and for, you know, other people in our family and friends. So I guess since I was already writer, a uh, writer and had been a writer for a long time, although it, travel writing is my main, my main gig, but the act of writing has always been really therapeutic for me. So writing down what my mother and I were experiencing helped me to deal with that. And then it gradually became something bigger that became rather than just the story of her final months of life. It expanded into the story to become the story of a relationship bef between a mother and son that spans decades and the story of being a misfit and following your dreams and finding your place in the world. So the themes really did expand and it gradually and organically uh, became a book. And it, it's obvious that your, your mother's short term memory, especially declined rapidly after um, she moved closer to you. But so did she, was she really aware of you writing things down? Were you able to have many conversations with her to uh, her? Her long term memory was better. So were you able to have some conversations that helped you fill in some gaps? Yes. Yeah. Her um, and you, you're you're totally correct. Her short term memory really was gone. So I, I couldn't ask her what she had for lunch if I visited her in, an in the afternoon, for example. But I could ask her, you know, what kind of clothes she wore when she went shopping in downtown Louisville, Kentucky in 1947 or something, you know. So um, so I was able to converse with her and ask her some questions about long ago things that she, and, you know, her marriage and things like that, too. Um, but she didn't know that I was writing a book. I think partially that was because I didn't really know for sure what I was doing. She did know that I was taking some notes because she was so funny, you know, even when she was in the nursing home and not feeling well, she had some Sometimes things that were so witty or clever that I would, you know, whip out my cell phone and start jotting down notes about what she said. So um, and she she would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you what are you writing down there? So she knew that I was making notes, but she didn't know what it was for. But again, probably it was because I didn't know exactly why I was doing it other other than to to psychologically, you know, process what was what was happening. Makes sense. How about your sister? She would have had a. Uh she would have also been basically raised as an only child. Have you ever, have you and she ever talked about your different experiences, her as an only child with a two parent family, you as an only child with a one parent family. Have you talked about those childhoods? We have a little bit. Yeah. And it is, it's kind of fascinating really, because it was two very, very different experiences, even though there were some of the same people, some of the same characters involved. Yeah. Since she's, um, she was born in 1951. And so her childhood was, you know, the entire 50s and into the 60s. And it was more of like this, I guess you could say like a stereotypical 1950s nuclear family with two parents, 
uh, you know, one kid. And then eventually I came along as a surprise kid much later. But um, she said that it was, you know, I think it was more of a traditional stereotypical family. And, you know, my father was a smart man and liberal and progressive in some ways, but I think he was sexist also. And so she said that, you know, he, what he said, what he said goes was the kind of the, the lay of the land at that point. And also they, you know, she, she wasn't really, she wasn't really presented with options in terms of religious beliefs or lack thereof. And so she was raised in a much more traditional household. By the time I was conscious, you know, after age four and I knew what was going on, like, I was just raised by this by this widow, but this you know single widow, you know who was in charge of everything in her life and had taken charge of her life and gone back to college and gotten her degree and she was you know liberal and educated and super smart and 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 uh, was not as traditional from a religious perspective or in other perspectives also. So so yeah, it's a really different. There could be a book written just about something like that, really. So two people, two kids that are siblings, but we we did have very different uh, growing up experiences. Yeah, absolutely. And this is really not relevant to anything except that uh, you had more of a childhood in the 70s. And uh, you you all often describe your turtlenecks and your either <laughs> patchwork jeans or corduroy pants. I just had this image in my head of you as this kind of scrawny little adolescent in so many fabulous turtleneck <laughs> combinations. Yes. If I that's not true, don't disillusion me, okay? Right, right. No, it, it it is very true. I tried desperately to fit in from a fashion perspective, and it was very 1970s fashion. And um, yeah, and I wish, you know, back then, people didn't have cell phones. So people weren't snapping photographs as often. But I do wish there were there was more visual documentation of how um, silly I probably looked. <laughs> Well, you mentioned the Partridge family, and I'm kind of I'm, I kind of have an image in you uh, of you in my head as the redheaded Partridge kid, but <laughs> kind of, yeah. I mean, it, there were, and you know, there's never been that many media representations of redheads, so yeah. I relate. So he did stand out to me just for nothing other than he was a redhead too. So yeah, I mean, I kind of yeah, the same kind of round face and red hair, and yeah, and and sarcastic attitude maybe too. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's there's some similarities there. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was a side tangent. I apologize. Um, <laughs> what did you did you take anything away from the the experience of writing the book that maybe or you know when you decided finally that you were going to write it as a memoir was did you take anything particularly away from the experience? Well, I I definitely found I definitely got what I'd hoped to get from it. You know, I found that writing the book to be really therapeutic. And I think a lot of writers find that, you know, if you have something that's so emotional, so difficult uh, or or so perfect, whatever it is, if you you have the story in your head. And so you may not even realize it's a story, but it's therapeutic to get it out there. So it really helped me to review various aspects of my relationship with my mother and various aspects of my life. And to really, you know, understand and appreciate my mother and both of our lives in a different way, um, since I was able to step back a little bit and also have other people read my work as I was writing it, too, because I was, you know, in in a writing group and, and in classes, too. And the other big lesson that I learned my, myself was, was how much a lot of us have in common with each other as human beings, even if, even if it's people that you might think you have nothing in common with. And that's been a really amazing and emotional surprise because I honestly at first as I was putting it together even after after I decided I was going to make it into a book I thought nobody's going to care about my personal story you know I'm just like one weird guy and you know who cares and it's not like I have the world's most incredible story to tell or so you know but then as I mentioned I you know I found that there's so many universal issues in the book in my story that that a lot of us have dealt with and so I've heard from a lot of readers and a lot of attendees at book events people from all different backgrounds about how they could relate to certain parts of the story and prepare for departure. And so it's really been an unexpected surprise and a great experience to feel such a connection with people who I would have thought I, I would have nothing in common with. If you just, you know, shown me their life stories, you know, or given me a summary of their life stories, I would, or, or you know, if I just met them, I wouldn't have thought we had anything in common, but, but we do. Mm -hmm. Do you, have you had any, Anything that surprised you about people's reactions of the book? The, the one of the surprises, I guess, is that I thought 
you know, the book is funny and it's sad. Um, if you, you've, you've read it. So I think you, you, I hope you'll agree to agree with that. And I thought that I thought that I needed to use a lot of humor partially because, you know, I'm not Abraham Lincoln, you know, I don't have like some fantastic biography that, you know, is like, so consequential <laughs> that, that it's, that it's, you know, worthy of world attention maybe. So I thought like, Oh, the sense of humor is what's going to carry people through the book. But what I found that's been surprising is that almost everybody who does comment or contact me about it is they're more propelled forward by the sadder aspects of the story or the misfit aspects of the story or the following your dreams aspects. So the people comment that they like the humor, but they really can relate to the difficult parts of the book, you know, about caring for an aging parent or dealing with the death of a parent or, you know, feeling feeling left out of, you know, when you're at school, feeling like a, a weirdo, like a misfit at school, or trying to find out what you want to do with your life and and making that happen one way or another. So what's been a really nice surprise is to hear how many different parts of the book people are able to relate to. And meanwhile, I really did think that people would be re- re- reacting more to the humor, and they still do, and I'm glad about that. But I'm I'm like so touched and happy that that people find emotional resonance in different aspects of the book too. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm jumping in for the second break of this episode. I don't know what it was about this interview. Did I start every question with and? Because I keep coming to the point where it's time for a break. And I am having to pause and then we're coming back from break with me saying and. Um, That's just the theme of this episode, I guess. At any rate, you are listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I'm speaking today with Mark Chestnut about his memoir, Prepare for Departure. We are coming back after he was talking about things that resonated with readers of the book. And my next question is starting back into that conversation again, as I mentioned before the break, we're starting off with an and. Let's get back to the interview. And that emotional resonance is that is that something that you would hope, is that what you're hoping people might take away from the book? Or is there one specific thing that you hope people will take away from it? Um, It is something that I hope that they take away from it. And I guess maybe, you know, now, if you'd asked me before the book was out, I don't know what my answer would have been. But now that I've heard from a lot of people, since the book has been out for a little while now, um, I think that the just the emotional the emotional connection that all of that a lot of us have in ways that we may not realize until we learn more about each other. I think that's a lesson I've heard from relate people who can relate to various aspects of the story and people who said they hear their own voice in different parts of the book. Um, you know, w- people seem to appreciate the parts of the book about growing up as a misfit, for example, and finding your passion, following your dreams, but also caring for an aging parent, losing a parent. And, you know, things that are specific to my situation, like, for example, I thought it was really interesting. One person, um, you know, my book, one, there's one scene in my book where I'm gay. And, and when my mother's in the nursing home, at one point, I'm, a, I, I'm hesitant and I, and I avoid identifying my husband by calling him my husband in front of one of the nurse's aides, because I'm afraid that what if she's homophobic and then she takes it out, she mistreats my mother and takes it out on her when I'm not around. And my mother wouldn't at that point wouldn't have been able to tell me. So I don't, 
identify Angel as my husband. And that bothered me so much. But then I heard from someone else who said she went through a similar experience where she self, she withheld things about herself, but it was because she was Jewish and she had her father in a hospital. And for whatever reason, she said she was afraid that the, some of the hotel, the some of the hospi- hospital, not hotel, some of the hospital staff might be anti-Semitic. And so she avoided mentioning the fact that they were Jewish. And so that's just one one really specific example of how I've been so, so surprised and fascinated by the fact that people can relate even in ways that we may be different, but there are certain things that that cross barriers and cross identities. And that's been really interesting to see. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's part of me that hears those and wishes that neither of you have to censor any part of your yourself in the hopes that, you know, you or someone you love is not, it, there's no ill effects, but unfortunately that's the world we live in. And it's, it's, right. It, it at least it's nice when you have those connections and you can meet people in places that that you both have commonality. Right, right. Yeah, it's really a way of connecting, and it's. I love uh, you know when I've done like book groups and public appearances. Like what, that's one of my favorite things is to hear other people's stories because it's just always it's sur- it's surprising and it's touching and the fact that people we can talk and we can relate to each other on on our on shared experiences even if they're different in so many ways but they are shared i mean there's a lot of things that the we have you know the the world can be so divisive sometimes but we have a lot of you know, stuff in common too mm-hmm. yeah i mean i am um, uh, i grew up in rural western montana so my my growing up experience is very different from yours obviously i am you know a, a woman you're a man et cetera, et cetera. but um you know still i can find things my father died in april of this year and so a lot of things about talking to your mother caring for your mother really resonated with me right well you know if i can ask you a question because one <laughs> of the things i was concerned about is you know if if my for someone and I, I'm so sorry about your father, but was reading this book did was it harder to to read a book like this because of the recent loss of your father or or did it just make it more relatable or how did you how did you react to it? You know, um, this one did not affect me as much as a few months ago. I had a woman writing about her experiences with cancer, and um, it was part memoir, part kind of things that you can do as as a person, uh, if you have cancer or someone you know has cancer, my father died of mesothelioma. And she was just talking about some of her experiences and things that she found that made it easier to navigate that process. That one was really, really hard for me. Um, This one was not as much. And I don't know if it's just, it's a few months later, or if I'm in a different place mentally. Um, This one just, this one was, I think, maybe easier because it was more about your relationship and less about you know, you talk about your mother's diagnosis and her care, but it's, that's not the focus. Um, so I think right. just the relational aspects made it easier for me. Right. Right. Yeah. Cause my book is, I, yeah. And it goes, as you know, it jumps back and forth in time. And so it's really mm-hmm. about the evolution of our relationship together, you know, from speaking from the quote unquote present present at the time of the book where it was my mother's last, last, last few months of life, but then with flashbacks to all different years and how yeah. um, our experiences were. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I usually ask people what they are working on now. And obviously, you're a travel writer. So you're probably working on various, various projects for that. But um, would you consider writing? um, Maybe not another memoir, but writing another book of some sort? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, as you guessed, I'm always working on travel writing, and so um, that's my main writing activity. And I also do photography, and I'm working on rebranding my travel blog. But um, I'm not working on another book yet. But I'm keeping my mind open and seeing what ideas might land next. And you know how it is as a, as a writer, things kind of like have to come to you. You know, um, so I'm I'm just scanning scanning the neighborhood in my mind and 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 it may be another book exploring family relationships somehow or and family history not exactly a memoir though um or it may be one that explores how travel affects our lives psychologically you know something that connects like the emotional levels the emotional aspects of travel too so I'm just not sure exactly what so if anybody has a good idea just let me know <laughs> okay sounds good I've I've nothing for you right now <laughs> <laughs> In terms of writing, uh, let's start with 
travel writing, I, um, I, I want to ask you if you have advice for people who want to write. And um, maybe there's somebody out there listening who has some of those aspirations that you had as a, as a kid about travel. What would you say to someone who's thinking about maybe writing about travel or something in in that genre is not quite the right sure. word, on, but you know what I'm, I'm saying? Right, right. Yeah. Well, first, I would say it's definitely a, a good idea to follow your passions and your real interests. So if travel is your passion and writing is your passion, then then definitely go for it. Um, for travel writing specifically, um, I can describe my path. Actually, there's a chapter in my, in, in my book that describes in a humorous way what my path uh, has been to become a travel writer. But um, first up, you s- start small. Um unless you have great contacts, you know, a travel and leisure or the New York times or something. Otherwise I would say, you know, start small. I started out by writing. I was already working in publishing, but in medical publishing, but I knew that I really, my dream is just to be in travel writing. So I started by writing a, a, a monthly travel column for a free weekly newspaper in New York city. And they didn't pay me a cent. I just did it because I needed to, you know, they call it clips. You know, you need your clips out there. Um, you know, to show what you can do and kind of establish yourself. And so from that, from with those clips, I was able to get start getting paid assignments and then eventually get a full time job. So um, so I would say, you know, be ready to start small. And the main thing is, you know, stay focused and don't ever give up. It doesn't matter how many, uh, you know, how many rejections you get. That just means you, the timing hasn't been right and you haven't found quite the right market yet but that doesn't mean that you're a bad writer or that you shouldn't shouldn't do what you want to do Mm -hmm. and then as someone who did not necessarily set out to write a memoir do you have advice for someone who's possibly thinking about writing memoir yeah, that's and that's been a fascinating experience because I, you know, I'd written one book before, but uh, like ten years ago, that was a travel book, so it's completely, completely different ball game. So with this, yeah, um, you need to do research a lot. Of, obviously, it's good writing. You need to like write and revise and write and revise and you know, you know, share your writing with with writing groups or you know, with a with a writing class or whatever. You need input from others about your book and you need lots of revisions, no matter what, how great a writer you are. But also you need to research. Um, You know, if you're going to try to get an agent, you need to make sure you're pitching to the agents who are appropriate for the kind of book that you're writing, uh, because otherwise you're wasting your time and theirs and you won't get anywhere. So, and every agent does have different interests. And then after that, you know, in my case, I was unagented. And so I went to indie publishers and but you need to be careful with that too because every independent publisher and every big publishing house have have very they have very different folk um you know areas of focus and so you don't want to waste your time you know sending out to inappropriate me, uh, you know publishers or agents who would have no interest in, in your work um and having said that then you'll still get rejections even when you send stuff out to your your proposal or your book to the places that are appropriate and so you just need to be prepared for for um for lots of rejections and again it doesn't mean anything about the quality of your work it just means either the timing was off or they weren't looking for your your thing wasn't quite a good fit for them so you can't you don't ever ever give up really and also the way i look at it too is you know how like i don't buy lottery tickets but if you buy lottery tickets you know you usually don't win right you might buy a lottery ticket every week but you won't win most likely it's it the odds are actually better for you getting your book accepted than for winning in the lottery i believe but if you don't buy the lottery ticket you're never ever going to win so just keep buying those <laughs> buying those lottery tickets except i mean keep sending your book or your proposal out there and you know celebrate every rejection because the more you se- the more proposals or the more manuscripts you send out to the more people the greater the chance that someone will say yes. And so so it's just like the lottery. You've got to be in it to win it. And so don't worry about the rejections. Celebrate the rejections because you're really putting yourself out there and you're on the road to doing something great because you just, you just never know exactly when it might happen. Time for our final break for this episode when we come back a little bit more about this uh, idea that Mark just mentioned about celebrating rejections, because that is definitely a positive way of looking at something that can feel very negative. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Pets bring such joy to our lives, and the GSMC Pets Podcast is here to share in that joy. We'll tell stories of pets finding their forever homes, acting in unexpected ways, being helpful, or just being silly. 
Whether you love dogs, cats, llamas, reptiles, fish, or you've never met an animal you didn't like, the GSMC Pets Podcast is for you. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with Mark Chestnut. Again, we are talking about his memoir, Prepare for Departure. As a reminder, in case you paused this and came back many hours later or you just forgot what we were talking about before the break, because that happens to me, we were talking about advice for aspiring authors and rejections. And so we're picking up with that conversation in the next question slash comment. I think you're the only person who's ever, I mean, people have talked about the rejections and, you know, what you can learn from them, but I think you're the only word person that's ever used the word celebrate. So that that's, I, I like that. It's a different way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause when I got it, obviously nobody wants to receive rejections, but I knew I was going to get some and I got a lot and yeah, I just felt like I, I, I love, I love ticking off. Like I, I kept like a checklist, not a checklist, but just like a, a list where I'd tick off every time I sent out a new proposal or, or, or a proposal to, or, or, or a copy of the manuscript to someone new. And I just love keep, they gave me a sense of satisfaction. I'm like every little check mark that I'm sending this out again to, or every rejection I get that puts me closer to, to actually getting the book published. Even if, if it's a rejection, it's just like your odds are getting better and better. So so yeah, celebrate it because it means you're 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 making an effort. Like you're really you're supporting yourself, you're believing yourself, you're believing in yourself. So yeah, it's worth it's it's totally worth celebrating. Well, and and when I think about it, at least you're getting a response, right? You're not just sending it out there into the ether. There's there's often some good constructive things that come with rejections. That's true, and you know I have gotten some non responses, which are worse. Um, mm-hmm. But the one the one good thing about those is that I I. I sent out to so many different publishers that the ones who didn't respond, I probably didn't even notice. So it didn't get me too down, but yeah, you, but you're absolutely right about some, some rejections can be very, very constructive. So I got some great rejection letters from a couple agents and a couple book publishers that, that said, no, thank you. But then they said what they really liked about the book, or they might've said, uh, you know, we really love this aspect of it, but we're think, but we're thinking maybe you need to position it more like this, you know, that kind of thing. So there were brief, briefly written rejections, but they were so constructive that they really did help me to to better pitch it in the future. So yeah, rejection people who reject can sometimes be really, really helpful. It's true. Yeah, absolutely. So when you take the time to read for yourself, um, do you have favorite authors and and genres that you turn to? Um, Yes. And especially during the course, since I first started writing down my experiences with my mother, um, I was drawn to to other memoirs and also to humor. And so um, during the writing process, you know, reading other writers in similar genres to what you write or want to write in, um, it can be a huge help. So I, I've become a big fan of David Sedaris, of Samantha Irby and Jenny Lawson, because I think they all have really distinct voices and they also know how to use humor brilliantly to deal with sometimes difficult topics. Um, I also like nonfiction because I'm always trying to learn something new about the world out there. And um, also, I really like, for example, um, another actually, this is another memoir, though, a Crying at H Mart which I thought was, was a beautifully done book about uh, a, a woman who's dealing with the illness and and uh, departure of, of her own mother. So yeah, there are a lot of different kinds of voices out there, but those are some of my favorites. Do you have particular favorites that you like to read on like an international flight? Um, it really varies. I mean, you know how it is. Sometimes you're in the mood for something like light and, you know, or, mm-hmm. or, you know, like suspense or whatever, something kind of silly, but other times you want something that's a little heavier. So it depends on what time the fl- <laughs> the flight is, I guess, and how tired I am. Um, but right now I'm reading, let me just see, like on my, on my um, Kindle, I have, uh, what is the book about vitamins or something? I'm reading it. Um, Goodbye Vitamin, which is a novel that's, uh, that's, 
kind of heavy topics about about a, a sick father. And um, so it's kind of memoirish. It's kind of similar to my stories. I'm still obviously drawn to s- stories that are kind of similar to my own. Um, but I'm gradually going to start getting out of that. I was just reading part of a book about like the biography of Cruella de Vil too, <laughs> just to balance it out. Oh, interesting. So, but you've got a Kindle, so you, you can mood read. You don't have to pack 20 books. Exactly. Yeah. And it took me a long, I don't know how it was for you, but it took, at first I hated the idea of Kindle and eBooks me and too. everything. Yeah. You know, it feels so good to ho- hold the book, but when you're traveling or even if you're just at the grocery and like you're, the line is longer than expected. Yes. To be able to, you always have a book with you. And that's a really, really wonderful thing. I still have some hard copy books too, but I always have one or two Kindle books just because you never know when you might need a re- some reading material, right? Yes. I um, pretty much, if, if I'm standing in a line, I am reading. Right. There's always every, every minute w- that you're waiting for something else is a chance to, to read or to learn something new or to explore more. And also to scroll through Instagram, of course. It will, <laughs> of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in terms of your, speaking of Instagram, in terms of your internet presence, if you can share uh, a website and any social media that people can find you on. Sure, sure. My, oh, my Instagram is Mundera, and that's spelled M like Mary, U-N-D-E-R-A, Mundera. And then on Twitter, I'm Mundera Media, spelled the same way. Um, but as like the one-stop shop for everything, all of my writing and the book and my other writing too, uh, you can go to my website, which is markchestnut.com. And that's Mark with the K. And the big thing to remember is to notice is that chestnut has no T in the middle. So it's not quite spelled like the nut itself. So it's M-A-R-K-C-H-E-S-N-U-T. And there I've got Everything that I that I publish in, in magazines and stuff is there, as well as lots of information about, about my book, too. Do people ever spell your name right? Very, very infrequently. And I, and I always point it out when people are like making flight reservations for me or whatever, if I don't make my reservations directly. But it still comes out wrong. Yeah, more than half of the time. So it's just my... Uh, it's it's the the you know my lot in life is to be, be forever correcting my, spelling my last name. <laughs> I guess, I don't know, I think maybe my ancestors were illiterate, and that's how the T fell out of the middle. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Or you you can make up a good story about that anyway. Right, right. Yeah. (laughs) They sold the T, they sold the T for (laughs) for something, I don't know what. (laughs) I like it. Um, We've talked about a variety of different things um, during our time together, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you want to make sure you highlight? Well, I I guess I just, I would just say that writing is something that's always been a part of me. And I think if, if the people who are listening to a wonderful podcast like this, it's probably a part of you for a long time too. And it's a really natural form of expression for people like us. So, you know, writing and reading are so powerful. So, you know, I would just, you know, I just want to like, end on like a positive note of support for writers and readers out there. Uh, because when you get your writing out there, whether it's in a literary journal, on a website, or in a book, um, you have a really unique chance to share your message and to connect with people in ways that you may not have thought possible. And that's something, a, the, a big lesson I learned from having my book, Prepare for Departure, be released. So if you love writing, keep at it like I did, never give up. If you just love reading, then I thank you so much for your, for supporting in, independent authors and publishers uh, like like my book is published by an indie publisher. And so I think it's it's a wonderful community of of writers and readers that we have here on this planet. And it's easier for, than ever for us to to, you know, to follow each other and to keep in touch um, thanks to social media and, and technology. So so let's let's keep the creativity going. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that. And thank you also for taking the time to talk to me about the memoir and your mom and just so many different things. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, yeah, thanks for for the great questions and for having me on. Thank you once again to Mark for joining me to talk about this memoir, to talk about his childhood, his relationship with his mother, how both of those things, of course, impacted who he became and is as an adult. As I said at the beginning, there are multiple points of entry for a reader for this book. Uh, If you're a fan of memoirs, if you uh, like to read 
parent-child relationship memoirs, if you had an awkward childhood, if you are part of the LGBTQIA plus community and that relationship with a parent and how that all worked for you, you know, you might want to, to read this. If you have a love of travel, if you've ever thought about being a travel writer, I mean, there's so many different different angles or different different ways of coming at this, but there's also just the the, the point that it's a memoir. It's it's funny. It's poignant. It is sad. It will make you laugh. It will make you roll your eyes at times about <laughs> the, some of the things that uh, Mark's mom says in certain circumstances. And it's just, I, I really, really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed getting to know Mark and his mother, even though I have never met and I never will meet his mother. And I've never met Mark. I'm getting to know Mark and a little bit even Mark's husband and his sister, but, you know, just getting that glimpse into someone else's life and seeing the ways that it mirrors or reflects my own life or what I can take from someone else's experiences that make me view my own in maybe a different way. Uh, And so that's really what I took from this memoir and just enjoyed so much. And it made me reflect. We, We talked a little bit about my dad's passing in April. It did make me reflect on things that I think about with my dad and that make me smile or maybe that have affected who I am as an adult. Um, So that for me is a gift always. You know, it's still the first year we're coming up on the one year anniversary. I can't believe that's here almost already. But then so I'm, I'm always thinking of him, but to have this kind of opportunity to for a more focused thinking, if that makes sense, or maybe not opportunity, but just to be able to read this book, to read someone else's experiences with a parent, and then to reflect on my own. Uh, that was that was lovely. So thank you to Mark on a personal level for my experience with this memoir. And thank you to him on a professional level for joining me for the podcast. As I said, if you are a fan of memoirs, you should definitely check this one out and get to know Mark and his mom and his family a little bit. I hope you're having a great week so far, as always. I hope that you will join me for the next episode where I will be speaking with author Coco Picard about her novel, The Healing Circle. So join me for that, hopefully. And as always, um, if you are a fan of this podcast and could help me out, it would be awesome. If you have not done so already, please um, like, subscribe, follow on whatever podcast platform you listen on. That way you will know when every new episode comes out, even when they come out twice in a week, which they sometimes do. And I believe next week we're having two episodes in a week, um, uh, two, uh, two interviews in a week. So should be a Tuesday and a Friday next week. But if you like, subscribe, follow, you will get those notifications and you will know without me even having to tell you. Also, if you could leave a review written or starred, just like you do for your favorite authors to help get those books out, a written or starred review really helps get this podcast out to other listeners. And also follow on social media, love hearing from you, hearing what you're reading, etc. You can follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Thank you so much. I hope you are having a wonderful week. I hope your Tuesday is going well. But as always, I hope your day, your week, your life affords you plenty of opportunities to get yourself lost in many, many, many good books. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Movie to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program